Good morning. Nathan, you killed it. So good. Um, yeah, so this is my fourth poetry talk that I've given to the church. And every time I get to do this, it kind of like challenges me to come up with a different way to talk about poetry. Um, so what I want, what I hope to do today is, number one, to talk about kind of three fundamental aspects of aesthetic experience or poetic experience in general so that we can kind of better understand where that comes from. And number two, to talk about what I'm calling the poetic act or the aesthetic act, which is like the making of a poem or the making of a piece of art, um, which I think is best when shared with other people. Because in my life, one significant way that I've been able to connect with others is through creativity and writing. Um, so those are, those are my main goals. So as I was writing this talk, I was sitting on my balcony, and it was sunny, but it was windy at the same time, and my dog was lying on the, in the only patch of sunlight on my balcony and on the only patch of the blanket that was in the sun, and I was thinking about how humans and non-human animals and even plants are kind of doing that sort of thing all the time. Um, we're like navigating our environments by trying to find what is um, enjoyable to our senses in a way, right? And we're trying to kind of, you know, we're drawn to things that are satisfying to our senses and we are repelled by things that are going to cause suffering or dissatisfaction. And I would say that that is one fundamental root of aesthetic experience in general, right? Um, the second aspect of aesthetic or poetic experience, I would say, is play. And play obviously goes beyond the human being as well. Um, there's a, a writer, Gordon Burghardt, who established five criteria that scientists use to try to determine whether a behavior from an animal is play or not. And um, two of those things are that the activity has to be spontaneous and exaggerated. And I, I was drawn to that. That's cool, especially because I think that the poetry that I like to read and write is spontaneous and exaggerated, I would say. <laughs> and another thing he said was that the activity happens when animals are healthy and free of stress. So I thought that was interesting. Um, turtles love to play with balls, like dogs and cats do, apparently. Octopuses have been documented playing with Legos. Uh, baby horses bounce around and nip at their mom's heels in their first days of life. Uh, mice start playing around 15 days of age, and apparently their play peaks at days 19 to 25, um, <laughs> which, which apparently aligns with the development of, of synapses in their cerebellum, um, which plays a critical role in muscle movement and coordination. Uh, young ravens play with basically any little object that they can find, from glass fragments to bottle caps to seashells um, to leaves and twigs, and that helps them familiarize their, themselves with the objects in their environment, but also like start discerning what safe from unsafe objects and that sort of thing. So it's interesting that we see play most commonly and most prominently in the young, and so not only is play fun, but it's also practical and crucial for development, you know, cognitive development, uh, coordination, as I mentioned, adjustment to environment, and connection with others. Bonding is a big part of play. Uh, Charles Darwin actually wrote, happiness is never better exhibited than by young animals such as puppies, kittens, lambs, and company when playing together like our own children. And this guy named Dr. Nathan Lentz, he lays out seven primary functions of play, um, in addition to things like learning social rules through play and managing stress. Um, the seventh function that he lists is the development of cognitive and creative skills. Um, and of course, humans exhibit all sorts of playful behavior, you know, um, comedy, informal and formal games, peekaboo. Um, dancing, karaoke, there's a long list, of course. And this seventh function of the development of cognitive and creative skills 
is obviously related to poetic experience, aesthetic experience, and the making of, of poetry and art. Um, so poetry allows us to play with language, with ideas, with associations and feelings and uh, objects from our environment and things like that. Um, and in his book called I is an Other, James Geary writes, children share with bonobos an instinctive metaphor making ability. These metaphors tend to emerge first during pretend play and at this stage metaphor is literally child's play during pretend play, children effortlessly describe objects as other objects and then use them as such. A comb becomes a centipede. Cornflakes become freckles. A crust of bread becomes a curb. Sounds like poetry to me. Um, and as adults, you know, we can, we can resort to creative activity and creative practices to kind of preserve that imaginative way to navigate our environments and stuff like that. So, so far, number one aspect of kind of sensory enjoyment. Number two, play. Number three, wonder, which is obviously related kind of to those, but um, Oxford Dictionary defines wonder as a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. Great definition. Um, and let's not forget the first of the Unitarian Universalist sources states, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. I would say that the practice of wonder is, is like attuning ourselves to, one way to look at it is attuning ourselves to the, the weirdness of, of reality um, and keeping that fresh and um, also a sensitivity toward encounters, really. And I would say, you know, our lives are made of encounters, right? We're, we're encountering ourselves over and over to the point of annoying ourselves, right? We're encountering others over and over to the point of annoying each other. Um, we encounter environments, we encounter ideas, visions, attitudes, feelings, vis um, stuff like that. And these encounters create feedback loops where the encounters shape our attitudes and conditioning and our attitudes and conditioning shape our encounters. And I think that a poetic state of being can play with those feedback loops. Um, all of this is somewhat obvious, but as Alfred North Whitehead wrote, it takes a very unusual mind to undertake the analysis of the obvious. Um, and I think that's one way to look at poetry, is that it modifies, renews, and stretches our relationship with the obvious. And to illuminate the poetry of the obvious, or the poetry in the obvious, um, I wanted to just touch on how, in colloquial speech, sometimes people refer, sometimes people describe a fact or a situation as poetic, you know. Um, I was watching a TV show recently, and this character kept on hitting red light over red, after red light after red light, and she was like, this is getting almost poetic. Um, and, you know, I had a friend who bumped into an acquaintance in a state that neither of them had ever been to, and neither one knew that the other person was going to be there, and they randomly were at the same place in another state, and my friend described that as poetic. Um, there's a group of raccoons behind my apartment that uh, sometimes, I love when they, when I have a sighting of these raccoons, because it's kind of rare, but they like, you know, they wander around in a big group, and they climb this wooden fence, and they climb up the wooden pole, and you know, that seems poetic to me for some reason when I watch these raccoons. And sometimes when I, um, you know, I haven't talked to a family member or a close one in my life, close person uh, for a while, and then I'll rent, they'll pop into my head and then they'll call me right at that moment. And that feels poetic to me. Uh, or what about how the acid in the human stomach can dissolve a razor blade? Or how camels have three eyelids? or how bats send out high-frequency sound and use the echo to determine the size, shape, and texture of objects in their environment. 
or how plants can measure humidity, detect gravity, and sense electromagnetic fields, the presence of water, or obstructions to their roots so they can redirect them. Yes, nature is bonkers. And um, these things are, you know, they produce wonder in us, or they produce wonder in me, the, the poetry and the obvious, and these things are poetic because they seem unlikely, unusual, amusing, mysterious, impressive, paradoxical, or ordinarily overlooked. And so, so far, I've mentioned these three aspects of poetic or aesthetic experience, which are often accompanied by a poetic state of being. And the poetic state of being can be something that's kind of naturally occurring, and it can also be something that we cultivate, you know? Um, but none of those things necessarily requires the making of poetry or the making of art yet. But at the end here, I wanted to touch on the poetic act or the making of, of poems or the making of art. And so, the word poetry goes back to the, the Greek word poesis, which means to make. And the German philosopher Martin Heidegger refers to poesis as a bringing forth or metamorphosis, such as that of a caterpillar turned butterfly or anything that unfolds something new out of itself. And I would say that that's what aesthetic objects or aesthetic vessels like poems or pieces of art are doing. They're bringing forth something new out of the base materials of our lives, imaginations, intuitions, um, like the alchemical process of transmuting base, material, base metals into gold. Um, and the poetic act can be spontaneous and exaggerated. It can be free form or highly formal. It can be improvised or pre-calculated, spoken or written, but I would say that the most meaningful poetic acts are the ones that are shared with others on some level. Um, and I kind of realized this perspective when I was in college. I was talking to a friend who also wrote poetry, and my friend was saying how he can just write poems and just burn them because to him it's not about sharing with others. Um, it's a, and he was implying or maybe even explicitly stating that, you know, to, to share it with others is somehow less authentic and more, you know what I mean, like superficial or all of a sudden you're going to worry so much about the audience that you're going to compromise your own integrity, stuff like that, right? I totally understand that, but at that moment I was like, no, to me the sharing of the poetry is more authentic perhaps than keeping it to yourself. Of course it depends on what your goals are with what you're writing and all that. But I've kind of preserved that attitude since then, and that was back in like 2008 or something. And, um, you know, so I, I wanted to say that, and I wanted to, at the end here, I'm going to read actually a few found poems that I wrote during the writing group. Um, but I want to just say that the writing group has been probably the most pronounced way that I've that I've been able to connect with others through writing essentially you know sharing writing with others them sharing it with me and um, so connecting through the creative act in the writing group and for years I've gone to this writing workshop at the Angel City Zen Center and in, at that writing workshop we're encouraged to write down phrases and words that people say in their pieces or they say during their commentary and then at the end, we cobble together, each of us cobbles together a found poem just using the language that we've been writing down all day from other people. And it's really fun, and I especially love to like mix and match phrases and like totally just twist it all around, but I only use that language, you know? And I fell in love with that process so much that I started doing it every Monday at the writing group, so I've been writing um, these found poems every Monday. And so I'd like to share three of those poems. The first one is from March 20th. I have been back to writing. Some of it has come out poetry. As I look over it, I am always writing about me. So I'd love to write about characters or things, but I seem to see life through this filter of gray. Where are the pungent smells, the transcendent perfumes, 
the possible and impossible dreams that dissolve into the opportunity of a space for things to bloom. The devastation of not touching a beauty that I know is possible is stealing my diary. But there's hope in knowing what I want so badly, at least it seems that way. Even without form or method, desire is the most hopeful thing. Is desire the most hopeful thing? I yearn to create my own whimsical characters and write stories about them. But of course, when I draw characters, they're on a river, but not a real river, and there's never any rules except to be nice to each other. In a place set back behind a gravel parking lot, behind a nondescript black door, the Ursula song from The Little Mermaid plays, and that which is from the dark seems to want to know my thoughts as I feel trapped by my own inconvenient meat stuff. Can you give me some context? The character, so thoughtful, so aware, asks as he shoves himself out of his own mind and into mine, whispering funny things to me to keep me patient, to not lose interest in responsibility, and to not use research to not make a difference. Weird stuff. <laughs> and these are probably even more enjoyable when you're in that session because like you hear it and, you're, and it's all language that you've been hearing all night and it's all mixed and matched. Okay, the second one is from, um, actually from the other day, April 17th. The dust clings to the shiny surface of a slow mirror. I may not be alone like a long-legged spider or like a thought wandering in my brain, but I'm a beautiful thing like you are. We even have matching pajamas. <laughs> we even weep into a small wooden jewelry box and feel naturally occurring love. It is easier for me to take that position. At this point, because of everything I've read, or because of all the characters who have introduced themselves to me, it's not worth it to take myths literally. But I've learned to not do too much or too little. And as with many Americans, I was raised nihilist. But that which is given is all but indescribable. I struggle to say I know someone unless they feel like a prism I struggle to artfully describe my past, which is like trying to build a satchel to hold a trickster god in. Knowledge records where we've been. Knowledge begrudgingly tells us a story. I can't exactly blame the youngest among us for not being polite. I sprout wings and fly into another digression. The most interesting visitor has the best translation skills has an eager face toward every first thought, toward every inelegant enjoyment, toward every natural ecology that writes unfinished houses filled with memories and hands reaching across the table. And the last one is a little shorter, um, and it's from March 27th. I have found the lost teacher who tells me that feeling, sorry, let me start again. I have found the lost teacher who tells me that the feeling of life itself is a mix between moral patience and moral agency. I can see time glowing in the oval mirror. So it's never truly dark here, though I still fear the night since the thoughts there are as long as the light itself that I both yearn for and fear. The lost teacher tells me I'm a small child with a monster under my bed. Tells me that embodied honesty turns every line into a curve, into artful commentary, into binoculars that make territorial lines be damned into novel assemblages in a pluralistic wilderness, into situation, situated knowledge where there is no view from nowhere, into the dust of the earth of unfinished meanings. Yes, everyone should be invited to the world in its making. Everyone should bear witness to the shape our mouths make 
when wrapping around that strange word that's too large to fit in our minds. That's it. Thank you so much.